Hey, future applauders. Do you like talking about movies? Like smart movies? Dumb movies? Science fiction movies? Horror movies? Fantasy movies? Do you like listening to people talk about a movie longer than it would take you to actually watch the movie? Do you sit with your friends and rant at great length about things you're passionate about? You may be interested in Shocked and Applaud. Join us while we go through peculiar movies, traditional movies, movies that we just like, movies that we find are just sort of like, huh? Do we follow somebody on social media and then they posted about a movie and we're just going to watch it now? Sure, why not? Our podcast is completely unscripted, so you're going to stumble through things with us because we stumble a lot. We're going to laugh. We're going to talk about what's problematic, but really, it comes down to talking about movies. You can visit us at shockedandapplaud.com, on Twitter at shockedapplaud, and Facebook at shockedandapplaud. We hope to see you there. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Robert Ortegon. I'm Ashley Chancellor. I'm Derek D. Great. (laughs) <laughs> and this is Collateral Cinema with Hindsight Movie Reviews. Welcome to Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We are podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, be it dabs, blunts, bongs, or joints, smoke it if you've got it. Especially since we're watching a... uh, we're, we're talking about a movie here with a lot of uh, green men running around, so to speak. <laughs> you know? But yeah, welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, with us returning uh, once again to the podcast is our friend Derek from Hindsight Movie Reviews and uh, Ratchet Book Club. Is that right? That, that, that's your other show? Yeah, those are two of them. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Those are two of them. Now I'm I'm sure that our listeners I mean if you want to if our listeners want to go and uh, check out our um, our episode that we did with Derek last time I believe what, what was it again it was uh, what was the episode that we did with it was a uh, Last Action Hero that's what it was oh yeah. Last yeah. Action Hero right yeah. yeah yeah so I mean yeah I'm I'm sure if you listen to our Last Action Hero episode uh, you probably uh, know where to find Derek but. Um, just real quick, uh, just give one more little introduction to yourself, Derek, just for those who don't know or haven't listened yet. So I'm Derek. Um, this is literally the calmest you'll ever hear me. Um, I am one of the hardest working men in podcasting. I think I have like nine podcasts, but right now only three are in active rotation. Um, you can find me at linktree backslash uh, sscast. That's where all of my shows are. Like it's literally branches off of one single tree. I do a movie review show called Hindsight. I do a book club by myself called Ratchet Book Club. I do a, a TV show a show where we review television uh, called RTO Podcast. Uh, right now, we're actually discussing the HBO version of The Watchmen. Ooh, um, nice. I do a show called Storytellers. Uh, I, I do all kinds of stuff. But right now, uh, I would say the easiest way to find me, there's one of two ways. One, like I said, Linktree uh, backslash SSCast. Or you can literally go on Google and type in R-A-S-H-A-N-I-I. I'm like the first five pages. Excellent. Nice. Well, yeah, I mean, and then we... Uh we actually uh, sent you the uh, list uh, for our season and you gave you the chance to pick the episode. And of course, that episode is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 1990. Uh, why, why did you want to why did you want to talk about this movie? What, what, what uh, spoke to you there? Because I'm like, 
like the rest of y'all motherfuckers. Like, when this movie came out, I was actually 10. And um, my mom took me to see it. Like, those are two things that don't happen that often. Like, seriously, when's the last time you were 10? And also, when's the last time your mom took you to a movie? Exactly. And she did both for me at the same time. And I sat there with my mouth agape. Like, I had just finished playing the arcade game and and and, and dying in the water level of the Nintendo game. And I, my soul was ready. But I... I wasn't ready for this. I oh, wasn't. Yeah. You know, and I was literally three days ago old when I found out Corey Feldman was one of the voices of one of the turtles in this fucking movie. Really? Seriously? That, that, to me, that was like, mind. Even, even back then, that was one of the selling points. It's like, hey, it's the guy from Lost Boys. He's in, <laughs> yeah, he's in, the, he's Donatello. It's like, damn. <sighs> Un- unfortunate truth. Never saw the Lost Boys. Really? Unfortunate Truth Part 2. Other than Mouth and the Goonies, never fucked with Corey Feldman. Thought he was a weirdo. Thought that he was like a Michael Jackson wannabe and didn't appreciate it one bit because I was a Michael Jackson wannabe and there oh. could only be one of us. I remember that movie. <laughs> that movie. What was that movie where he's Michael Jackson dancing? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. We oh. talked about that on the show, dream, too. Dream a little dream. Oh. Right? Yeah. Dream a little dream. Oh my god. Yeah, where he had the, the jacket and the glove mm-hmm. and the whole nine yards and he still breaks out and- I started laughing my ass off, dude. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, that's oh. amazing. <laughs> oh, Corey Feldman. And then him and Corey Haim got together and I was like, That's too many Corys and I just yeah. I noped out. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't know. I just found out. But it's the Feldman, bro. The and, then, and then we got a license to drive with both the Feldmans right? <laughs> or both the Hames or the Corys of Hollywood. Both the Corys. Yeah, they, both they, the Corys. They, they were a force to be reckoned with. That's for sure. They were something. Yeah. But in this movie, I mean, he, he I, I got to say that his vocal uh, performance was really spot on here as, as the rest of the uh, vocal cast and also the cast who actually uh, donned the costumes and did all the actual martial arts action. It's like, I mean, that was kind of a feat in its own right. I mean, those costumes were like how heavy they, they were like, they added like at least an extra 150 pounds to every, to every uh, actor that was uh, wearing them more than a soldier. I don't know. Yeah. It's, man, it's like, and, and you just look at the action and everything. They were doing, like, flips. They were doing, like, you know... Roundhouses. Roundhouses. Dude. Oh, my God. Like, Flipping punches. Her. It's like... And this was all with all that latex and all that crap on them. Yeah. I mean... Oof. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was really, really cool, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Bo, how old were you when this came out? Ooh. 19, 1990? 1990. Let's see. I was born in 82. I would have been 12 ish, 11 ish, or something. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to do the math, and I, I suck at math right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 89, so I wasn't that old. You know. Oh, yeah. You were just a few years old. I wasn't even out. born yet, so. <laughs> wow. So I'm, I'm literally the only one here who actually remembers the original, uh, other than Derek, who remembers the original theatrical run, huh? Mm hmm. Damn. The the theatrical fiasco because they were not prepared for us children and our uh, excitement over this fucking movie. Oh no! I mean, yeah, this was like a cultural touchstone if you were under the age of uh, like eleven years old. I mean, it was like wow, just seeing the turtles just come come alive like that. You know? Can you mm-hmm. imagine? Yeah. Better than uh, Michael Bay did it, right? <laughs> oh my god! Fucking Michael Bay! <laughs> yeah. But yeah, let's let's go ahead and uh, talk about the creature effects in this movie, which is to me was like the one of the other really big selling points of this movie. You know, obviously is seeing the turtles come to life, and it was done by uh, Jim Henson's uh, special effects company. And honestly, this is like just a powerhouse in puppetry and and you know makeup effects and everything. I mean, just the way that they actually managed to make these uh, these what are essentially just puppets, puppets on uh, on uh, a, a dude, animatronic essentially head. animatronic head and everything. Yeah. It's like they made them emote. They made them feel like like real, you know, like like they had real personalities. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> I mean, but 
<laughs> we have the movie watch on right now, and we're all spacing out on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. Like, seeing these characters kind of come to life, I mean, especially if you grew up with the animated series, right? Yeah. You know, like, I, I could definitely, like, see how that was, like, a big deal at the time. And I, I got to say, from, you know, as much as I know the characters, I feel like they're pretty well adapted here. Yeah. And not to mention that to this day, they still look amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, better could, than the other two films. Yeah, actually. They do. <laughs> better yeah. than the other two films and way better than the actual CGI. I mean, like I said, just the way that they actually made them feel like, you know, real living, breathing characters. Yeah, these here. turtle suits were made pretty good. Holy crap. All this. Yeah. Oh, the, mm -hmm. the shading and the latex. But Derek, like, I mean, what, what, what was your. Uh, what was your take on the uh, special effects and uh, which one, which turtle is your favorite for one? And uh, see, see, that's what makes me mad. That's the part that makes me mad because Donatello is my favorite. And now that I know that Corey Feldman is connected to him, I feel unclean as fuck. Aww. Like, I know <laughs> Corey's been through a lot and I respect what he's gone through and what he survived. And that's not the reason why I don't fucking like the guy. I just don't like him because of the Michael Jackson thing. Other than that, he's a really cool dude, I think. And he's been through a lot of trauma and I'm not going to I'm not going to belittle him for oh, that. Course. I'm going to belittle oh, him for everything fucking else, including the haircut. Um <laughs> but Donatello's always been my guy. He's always been my guy. Even in the video game, uh, in the cartoon, he was the smartest one. Uh, he was the one who was the scientist. Back then, I wanted to be a scientist. In the video game, he had the bow stick that could hit through the bottom of floors and the Nintendo version. So then when you fell all the way to the bottom of the pit, because you couldn't make a simple one square jump from mm -hmm. one spot to the next, uh, you could do the bow stick to kill everything that was around you again, even though that jump was some absolute bullshit and Konami can go to hell. Um, <laughs> exactly. I that that frustrated me so much when I played that level. And but yeah, Donatello <laughs> was pretty much like the uh, he was kind of like the workaround for all of that. In that yeah, and, and then he was like the voice of reason. Like I know Leonardo was the leader, but he wasn't really. Donatello was the leader in my eyes. Like he was the one who was always figuring stuff out and bringing them all back together. And even in this movie, he was the voice of reason because uh, you know Leonardo and Raph Raphael didn't really get along. But Donatello's my guy. And so to see Donatello look like I figured Donatello would look and see Donatello doing all this cool stuff just made me so fucking happy. I didn't care that CGI was involved. If you had asked me, my dumbass would have told you there are really turtles living underneath the underneath the sewers in the sewers in New York City. I didn't fucking know. I didn't fucking care. I had never been in New York and California. Mm -hmm. Sure, there could be fucking... There's a fucking animatronic rat living in a building around the corner from my house named Chuck. So why wouldn't there be turtles <laughs> living underneath New York City? Let's go. Like, so... And they like pizza. They like the same shit I do, Mom. They eat Pizza Hut. They, they put, like, fish on theirs. I've never done that. This shit sounds weird. But they do everything else and that's cool so i was fooled wholeheartedly jim henson did an excellent fucking job for a 10 year old and i was fooled until i bought the movie and then i realized huh they don't really look as good as they did when i was 10 and that was when i was like 12 and they still look great but they didn't look like real turtles anymore and that's when the whole mystique was gone for me Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is very convincing. Like, e e even today, I feel like it would be very convincing if you showed this to a kid. They would just be like, wow. <gasps> They'd be like, whoa. Oh my God. Right. And, oh, my God. And, and, and it's a testament to the quality of the work that they did on these uh, models. Because, like, compare the... Uh, I, I saw online not too long ago on an auction site that they had the original... I believe it was the Leonardo suit. They had the original Leonardo suit from the 1990 movie. And then you compare it to like uh, the Raphael suit from the third movie. And they've, that one has just aged like crap. It's, it's falling apart. It's, mm -hmm. it's just in bits. But like, even though there was a little bit of restoration work done on it, the, the suit still looks great to this day. It still looks, looks movie quality. And if, if you put it on, it's like, yeah, I'm sure that kids will look at that and they would just be like, whoa. I mean that, that that's I mean that was like just a real feat of uh of special effects engineering. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, no, I, I actually, you know, when I was watching this with you guys, I was thinking that the the effects are really good. I uh for like a movie in nineteen ninety, I, I 
kind of like the whole aesthetic that's going on here too. I think that like the colors that they use kind of help sell it. Yeah. 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 It, the, the, the way that they use colors in this movie is very interesting. Like, like, like you compare it to secret of the use secret of the use feels like it's a bit more cartoonish. Yeah. It's pretty low. You know? This yeah. one's a little bit more dark and gritty for what it's worth, you know? Yeah, it's way more dark and gritty. And and, and that's more reflective of uh, what Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was as a comic book back like, in the day. It's like the Batman, dude. Yeah, just like the Batman. Yeah. Exactly. Like, Incidentally, like, there's a Batman uh, versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that oh, recently that's came right. out. <laughs> Have you seen that, Derek? The Batman versus uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, DC no. movie? Oh, apparently wow. that's a thing uh, that happened a few years ago. I, 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 I'm I sure it's on HBO Max. Probably. And probably. I am going to hunt it down. I won't make my, my, I, I won't make my beloved wife watch it because, you know, she's a grown up, but I'm <laughs> going to enjoy it every moment of it. Yeah, it, it, it looks uh, very well made. I mean, it's just about as well made as the uh, recent spate of D- DC animated uh, movies and whatnot. Yeah. But, and also, on, on the note of like the dark and, and gritty uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they did announce that last Ronin game coming out. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Uh, graphic yes. novel Last Ronin. Yeah. Yeah, where I think it's... Uh, it's Michelangelo. Michelangelo is the last one left, and he's done like a complete like 180 personality shift. Yeah, it's supposed to be like uh, like the recent God of War games. Yeah, that's what they said. It was going to be kind of like the more modern God of War games. So I'm actually kind of hyped for that. That sounds like a lot of fun because I, I love the last uh, couple God of War games. <laughs> yeah, they, they, were, they were awesome. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, no, this uh, this movie, I think uh, for like, like I said, again, for for a movie right at the beginning of the 90s, um, I, I think it really does sell the idea of these characters coming to life. I mean, and you've also got April O'Neil played by uh, Judith Hegg, right? Yeah, Judith Hegg in, in, in this movie. Like, I to think me, that's my favorite April. No, she, she's my she's my April O'Neil, other than the uh, April from the the cartoon series. <laughs> oh, looks like looks like Derek has something to say about that. You know, she didn't come back for the sequels because she didn't approve of the violence in a fucking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, right? Are you kidding what? me? That's why. No, I'm deadly serious. Like, she didn't come back because she didn't approve of the violence in this fucking movie. And I'm like, you can go fuck yourself. Um, yeah. She also didn't like the six day schedule, which I'm okay with. But the amount of violence, go fuck yourself. Also, she um, refused, literally refused to wear the yellow jumpsuit that April O'Neil wore in the cartoon. She thought it was fucking horrifying and refused to wear it. Oh, oh so okay. she just did that like yellow raincoat kind of thing, Ooh. right? It was yeah. like a yellow like like waistcoat. But that that's like in one scene. She's like a prima mm-hmm. donna. Yeah. She's a prima donna, right? It's like, oh my God. That that pisses me off, honestly. Okay. Damn all it. right. I'll, I'll walk it back. But she is hot. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, who, who was the girl that was in the next two movies? I, I don't remember her name. She was actually pretty okay. Yeah, she, yeah, she's fine. she wasn't bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there's no taking away from her performance. At least she came back, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. She wanted to be there. That counts for something. Yeah. And- Casey Jones, uh, what was the actor that played him? Elias Codius. Yeah, he came back for the third one, right? But he wasn't back in the sequel. No, he wasn't in the sequel for some reason. I, I don't, I don't know. I guess, I mean, th- th- this is what's interesting about you bringing up uh, Judith Haig's, uh whole thing with the violence is just how nerfed the second movie is when it comes to violence. I mean, they never they, use their weapons, they, they, right? they, or barely at all. They they barely even use their weapons like a few times, and I mean. That better not be them trying to capitulate to Judith Haig and then her just refusing anyway. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I hope that's not the case there. <laughs> I mean, but they have vanilla ice in the second one. <laughs> that's <They> true. <laughs> that scene is fucking legendary. <laughs> I just want to point this out real quick because I, I got to be, you know, I always go to the trivia for these. Like, I love seeing this. So, yeah. Judith Haig was April O'Neil. Whatever. Yeah, great. Jennifer Bill, Marissa Tomei, Sandra Bullock, Nicole Kidman, Melanie Griffith, Sean Young, Lorraine Bracco, Winona Ryder, and Brooke Shields were all also considered for the role of April O'Neil. Oh, Damn. man. 
I can Rook think of a shoot. couple, you know, a few of those choices that would have actually been perfect. Maybe Winona Rook, Ryder. Exactly. Tome. Yeah. Winona Tome off the top of my head. Rosa Tome and Winona Ryder would have been. Oh, Winona Ryder, also, you know? also uh, Judith refused the red hair of April O'Neil. She thought it looked stupid. What? That's the other part. But isn't she redheaded in this movie? Hold on a second. Let me tell you. She is not. She's no, brown hair in this movie. Hair. God she damn refused it. to make her hair red. She thought it looked hideous. Man, why didn't they go with one of those other girls? I mean, those are those were actual fucking names in the industry as well. I mean, actually bigger names than Judith Haig, honestly. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and she's trying to pull rank like that? Yeah. No, mm-hmm. what? <laughs> God damn it. I don't know. That change that changes though. That color that changes is the a movie lot for, for me. me. <laughs> yeah. That change God damn it. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Well, she was very hey, it's it's all good. It's all good. We we can handle <laughs> the truth, I, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, as far as her performance goes, it was I good. Mean, yeah, she sounds it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She 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 kind of nailed it. I mean, she should have gone along with the iconic uh, look of April O'Neil. But I mean, okay, whatever. She, she didn't come back, so whatever. Yeah, and uh, I, I think like the relationship of her character, you know, with the turtles and with Katie, uh, with Kate Casey, <laughs> is um, is pretty compelling. I mean, it worked for me. Definitely. I mean, I mean, I guess there's a romantic uh, element. Like they they kiss at the end. It's not very convincing, though. Yeah, but I mean, they they. I mean, they always did end up together, right? Yeah, I think canonically, uh, Casey Jones and April O'Neil are are a thing. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, it, it you know you're kind of expecting it, so it's kind of obligatory at that point. Like, okay, yeah, they're gonna kiss at the end. I I know that in the CGI animated movie, they were a couple. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and that that was an interesting movie in its own right. We might have to do that at some point, but. Here in this movie, yeah, I, I think that her performance was okay. It was pretty good, you know? And, and she worked well off of the actual actors in the turtle costumes as well. Mm-hmm. It's like, I mean, it, it does take a good amount of uh, talent to, you know, act around animatronics like that and make it convincing, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good point. Um, what did they do for Splinter? I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of wondering about that. Was that just uh, animatronic or? It's fully Very animatronic. much so. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I don't think they had anybody uh, wearing a costume for Splinter it because it doesn't look it like it. It took three puppeteers to operate the Splinter puppet. Damn. Kevin Clash, Damn. who was Elmo, not sure if he still is, um, performed the puppet while the facial expressions are remote controlled by another puppeteer and the arms are controlled by a puppeteer who worked along with Kevin during the performance of the puppet. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that makes sense. I mean, if you recall from uh, Spaceballs, uh, Barf's costume, just, just the ears alone took like two, two puppeteers, puppeteers just right? to work oh that God. in yeah. unison. So yeah, that, that makes sense. That tracks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I think he looks pretty good actually. Again, I mean, oh, yeah. He, Looking at this movie, I mean, it's believable. I feel like that's a character. Yeah, I, I feel like he's way better in this movie than he is in the other two. Yes. Like, I, he, he looks better, and I think that his uh, character is a little more... Uh, it, it's a little closer to what it was, at least in the uh, comic book, if not the animated series. And honestly, he's the best character in in the movie, in my opinion. My my, my The... My, what I think are like the two breakout characters in this movie are Splinter and Casey Jones. Cause they, cause to me, they're both the most compelling characters in the movie, mm-hmm. you know, like, 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 especially whenever uh, Splinter is uh, kidnapped and everything. And he's uh, pretty much uh, giving wisdom to Danny to, uh, you know, the, the kid that's uh, the son of the uh, station owner. Yeah. The delinquent, the delinquent <laughs> goddamn delinquents. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, he he is actually the most emotionally balanced character as well. I mean, he he really is the anchor for these four these four boys, you know, these these four kids. Mm-hmm. You know? Italian kids. Italian kids. Yeah. I, I Italian. I Italian. <laughs> <laughs> yep, named after Renaissance artists, of course, as we all know. And only one of them with the Brooklyn accent. Yeah, Raph. Yeah, Raph he, is the only one. Right. 
Raf is the Raf is so that's why you're you're the Raf, right, Robert? Uh, he's, the ref. It's the, he's like the Brooklyn guy. Brooklyn, you know? the Brooklyn. Bronx. Mm-hmm. I'm the Bronx. Yeah, it's that is weird. You would think that the other turtles would have a little more of the of the New York accent, you know, especially you know, growing up. They're in, yeah, they all grew up in the same place. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that doesn't track. It's like, I mean, if we're thinking about it, they should all speak like Splinter does. They should all have an Asian accent, but uh, <laughs> try not to think about it too hard. Technically, yeah. Technically. <laughs> they were really raised by him. <laughs> came, came to America, though. But yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think as a character, he's uh, he, he, he's definitely one of the most compelling. I was going to mention Casey earlier as well, but we'll move on to him. But uh, with Splinter, I mean, just kind of like, you know, bordering that line of like, you know, master and like father. And, you know, you could really see him try to like kind of connect, kind of connect with them. I mean, there is that like running gag with him, you know, saying I made a funny at the end. Yeah. But I, I think the best scene with Splinter is the uh, campfire scene. Like to me, that that's like my favorite. Oh, in the woods. Yeah. In dude, the woods. That, that's, that's a better scene. That's my favorite scene. Yeah. Just, you know, just script wise, you know, because I mean, that, that hits you like a, it's an emotional scene that hits you like a ton of bricks. Like and then you even see Michelangelo crying and shit. It's like, yeah. wow, th- this is actually a really like deep and compelling moment between between this th- this character that raised these four kids, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and they're channeling him. I mean, pretty much like, I guess, Jedi Force style and everything. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very moving moment and it's a testament to the script of this movie, which I think is actually still still pretty tight to this day. Yeah, like, I think it holds up. Yeah, it, it, it holds up well. I mean, especially all, with all the different fight scenes in it and everything. I mean, they're, they're, they're very well done. Yeah. 100 percent i agree yeah yeah but yeah on to casey jones yeah casey i i think is also i agree with you one of the breakout characters here um he really just kind of steals the show wherever he's at and and he's really just fun loving i mean even when you're kind of you know seeing him go up against raf it's it's you really don't know who to root for because both of these characters are awesome yeah i mean mm-hmm. they're, they're the perfect foil for each other yeah you know mm-hmm. But also there, there's that scene where he's with uh, Donatello and they're uh, they're trying to fix that truck and everything. And they're they're just trying to one up each other with the insults. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they build a real camaraderie with Casey that, I mean, it, it makes me wish that they would have brought him into the second movie. But I don't know, maybe for some reason they wrote him out because he wasn't kid friendly enough or whatever, which I mean, don't ask me why. The violence. Violence. Yeah. It's like, I mean, damn it. It, it, it. That that was the first thing that I noticed uh, with when, when I, even when I was a kid, when I saw Secret of the Ooze, it's just like, why aren't they using their weapons? Why, why is this, why is this just a bunch of silliness? You know? Mm-hmm. I mean, why is this what they decided to do to bring me Bebop and Rock and Rocksteady? I know they, they left them out. I mean, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess there are kind of like characters that are analogous to them, but yeah, Toka and Razar, but it's like it's just not the same. I mean, they they were okay characters in the second movie, but no, it we should have had a proper '90s bebop and rocksteady, like no. absolutely in the second movie, and and it's a it's a damn crime that we didn't get that. I feel we didn't get it until the CGI Michael Bay movie. Oof. Yeah. Oof, but yeah, Casey Jones though, I, I like I like that his whole fighting style is just sports ball. Mm-hmm. It's just sports, you know. Like he brings out what he brings out like a hockey bat. He brings out a uh, cricket a cricket thing. bat. Like he's, he uses mm-hmm. a golf club at some point. Baseball bats. Yeah, and and that that's how he's always been. I mean, he just has a bunch of uh, different uh, sports sticks with him, and. And, and I mean, I, I like how he's just he just feels like he needs to go out and clean the streets. He's, he's not like a uh, he doesn't have real training, it seems like. But he just goes out there, puts on a hockey mask and he cleans up the streets, you know, and then and that's just how doing he, his part. Yeah, he's doing his part to keep his community clean of, you know, punkers. I, I think he calls them. <laughs> 
And, and, you know, for what it's worth, I mean, he goes up against Raph that first time, and that's just kind of like a contest of, like, strength. But uh, the first opportunity he gets, he comes to aid the Turtles. You know, he kind of joins that cause right away. Oh, yeah, and, and, and that's how you know that he he's a cool guy. Yeah, you know, he's a real one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, also, I mean, his he's also got a good foil to uh, April O'Neil in this movie as well as, as the romantic foil. They really play off each other, I guess, in kind of that, like, Han and Leia way. Kind of, sort of. Yeah, they, that, that's yeah. a good uh, analogy there. Where it's like they hate each other, but they obviously like each other. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of a common trope, though. I mean, you see yeah. that in a lot of anime, but... Very common. Yeah, but but here it, it, it's kind of especially when they're at the uh, farmhouse and everything. It, it's it's kind of endearing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Our family grows. The city itself will be our playground to use as we please, rewarding ourselves and punishing our enemies. We've been looking for you, Miss O'Neill. There is a new enemy. Freaks of nature. Together, we will punish these creatures. What the heck was that? Looked like sort of a big title in a trench coat. I just want to point out that uh, even though they fall in love, Casey never calls April by her name. No, never. Not that once. is true. Although I guess that's kind of realistic because in most of my relationships, I stop calling my significant other by their name. It's always just babe or hey boo. <laughs> yeah. Hey boo. What's up, boo? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, yeah, they they have a cute little dynamic going there and. I mean, at, at the end of the movie, I do feel that their final kiss is a little unconvincing, you know? It's just kind of obligatory, right? It's obligatory by that point. She, she, she's basically like, look, are you going to kiss me or not? It's, it, it's like they're trying to rush to it or whatever. Are just going to do it already or what? Are, are you just going to do it already? Do I don't it. know. I kind of feel that. Like, when, when she says it to him that way, I'm like, damn, okay. <laughs> it's like, all right, all right. <laughs> now... Now the Shredder. Let's go ahead and talk to, about the Shredder as a character. Oroku Saki. Cheese Shredder. Oroku Saki. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting uh, how they uh, presented the origin story of Hamato Yoshi and Oroku Saki this time because it's it's different in the comics and it's also very different in the animated series. I, in the animated series, Splinter is literally Hamato Yoshi, like he's he's Hamato Yoshi mutated into a rat. But, but here, uh, Splinter is the pet rat, right? Yeah, he was the pet rat of uh, Hamato Yoshi, and he m- witnessed the murder of his uh, of his master and his, and his wife. And, and apparently learned martial arts by just watching him. Seriously, he just learned martial arts just by imitating what Hamato Yoshi was doing. Self-taught, smart guy. Smart guy. I yeah, know Kung something. Fu. Exactly yeah. right. <laughs> like, like a total Neo moment. Happened in Ninjutsu. In, uh, what, what was it? Uh... One movie with Matthew McConaughey. Oh. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was Bradley Cooper. We just took the pill. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Limit. Fear, not Fear. Limitless. It was Limitless. Limitless, Limitless right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you just watched the movie and then took the pill. Or took the pill, watched he, the movie, and it's like, hey. He, I knows, martial martial, he knows martial arts, dude. <laughs> oh, my God. I feel so much smarter now. <laughs> it's like right. math. Oh, I did math. I'm smart now. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm getting smarter, dude. <laughs> Goddamn meth heads. <laughs> oh, my God. But, yeah, there's this kind of, like, 
long history with the Rokusaki and Hamato Yoshi, right? And yeah, yeah, you know they kind of build him up, and uh, I I think that the Shredder delivers. He's intimidating. He's com- you know demanding in, in terms of his presence. You know, alone, very much so. I mean, uh, of course, you know, I mean. The, the the original uh, Shredder was uh, the same the same actor who played uh, Uncle Phil in uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh mm-hmm. shit. And yeah. Rest so in he, peace, he, Uncle Phil. Rest in peace, Uncle Phil. Exactly, man. I mean that that was just like uh, the best uh, Shredder to me. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. pretty awesome. but this Shredder, I mean, yeah. I mean, when you first the first time you see him in this movie is just from behind, and he's watching April O'Neil and all those televisions, and then he just tells them to like. Like find this woman and silence her, and, and you're like he he doesn't even need to say a whole lot of words to do. He's just like find her, silence uh, her. Uh, uh. And 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 the thing that gets me, oh Shredder, who could have anybody he wants to fight for him because he's a fucking Shredder. Yeah, and he's a badass. He has a bunch of like fourteen and fifteen year olds working for him, and it's like, dude, what kind of like carnival shit are you pushing here he, like he, pull, he pulled a joseph coney that's what he did i don't know Pretty those much. kids were based as fuck though those kids were just fucking enjoying life man oh yeah, yeah that, that. but if if you're a if you are a mutant turtle with weapons and you can't kick a 13 year old's ass i'm really concerned for you like, <laughs> at least have adults in this movie fighting against the turtles give me something don't pull back the mask on one of them we find out he's like 12 and then it's like oh my god oh my god we're beating up children yes mm-hmm. you've been beating up children this whole time like <laughs> that, that it's is one of those movies that if i watch it as an adult i'm just like Dude, if a ninja can't beat up a 12-year-old, what are we doing here? What's going on? Well, I mean, it is New York in the fucking 90s. They might not have been able to beat up a 12-year-old, <laughs> to be honest with you. But that's because the 12-year-olds are shooting in 1990. Oh, exactly. And to be yeah. fair, they're teenagers themselves, although, you know, trained fair. since birth. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and, and yeah. Mo- mo- here in this movie, most of these are pretty much like just uh, kids from the streets that they just hire that are, you know, kind of, you know, outcasts, derelicts, juveniles, mm-hmm. juveniles. Join yeah. us and you will magically learn karate. Cobra I mean, Kai. Y- y- I, I got to admit, that <laughs> sounds like a pretty cool uh, thing to get into. I mean, I mean shit, yeah. I feel like that'd be more was- effective than Scientology. <laughs> they're just they're just bringing dude they're just bringing martial arts back to the valley bro exactly we'll teach you how to kick ass and <laughs> you get to have a good time and you get a hawk tattoo on your back there you exactly go. and there's that kid smoking a fucking cigar man when i watched that i was like this wouldn't fly today no man like th- 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 these kids are literally like just uh, like hey you got cigarettes and this kid just brings that hey you want regular or menthol oh god <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, uh, I like, mean, knowing that they're little ass kids, though, makes that first scene really fucking creepy where April is walking across the lot and sees the, the thieves stealing merchandise from the van and they pin her to the ground oh, so they yeah. can steal from her. That was the whole thing. They pin her to the ground so they can steal from her. And then all of a sudden the side gets thrown and busts out the light. And that's the intro. The yeah. mutant turtles beating everybody's ass. <laughs> It's a good way to introduce them. It is. Yeah. 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 By the way, you guys know that uh, Skeet Ulrich and uh, Scott Wolf are in this movie. Are you kidding me? Yeah. As uh, members of the Foot Clan, as it happens. Skeet Ulrich. Skeet Ulrich. I'm not fucking joking. <laughs> fucking homeboy from Scream. Yeah. God damn. That's crazy. I didn't see that in, in the in the credits. Uh, This is on. Uh, this is. Yeah. That the, the was uncredited. I'm getting this from Wikipedia. Uncredited, yeah. Huh. Wow, yeah. No kidding. Apparently, that that's mind blowing to me, man. It's like, no way. Was this his first movie? Was it their first movies or what? Possibly, right? Possibly, you would think so. I, I, I remember, mean, I remember that guy in Hackers, right? Like, yeah. yeah. What did he do before Scream? Before the Hackers, Weekend right? at that's Bernie's. Okay, he was in Weekend at Bernie's as an extra. Um, Chattahoochee, everybody wins, and then TMNT. No kidding! Wow, As Doug. God damn it! I'm 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 learning so many new things about this movie that I didn't catch when we were researching this shit. What uh. the fuck? <laughs> but 
Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little more about just the foot in general because, like you, like you said earlier when we were setting up, Derek, like there's all there's like this clandestine group of uh, ninjas, like a bunch of kids are becoming like ninjas and stealing shit, and nobody notices. Exactly. How fucking bad is New York at this time? You got <laughs> fucking. It's not like they're walking around it like like changing into these outfits when nobody's looking. <laughs> these kids are literally walking the streets of New York in a ninja suit. <laughs> literally, yeah, yeah. And not only are they walking the streets of New York in a ninja suit, they're walking the streets of New York in a ninja suit and are actively fucking shit up, like going out of their way to try and cause chaos. And nobody calls the cops. Nobody yeah. reports this at all. Okay. Well, I mean, the the cops are are in this movie. They're they're portrayed as uh, pretty much being like uncaring about what's going on here. They they well, they, they think who would have thought the cops would be uncaring about something that's going <laughs> yeah, on right. the streets of New York? Oh, yeah, who would have thought that? NYPD, come on now. <laughs> who would have fucking figured? <laughs> right? Who would have figured? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but here it's like like the police commissioner is just outright dismissive of any talk about any kind of Foot Clan. Like like he's just outright dismissive of it. So they're not just tracks. bastards as all cops are, but they're they're uber bastards. Uber they're, bastards. They're, they're lazy bastards. That's what they <laughs> there are. You go. Lazy, <laughs> lazy fucking bastards. Exactly. exactly. And it's like there's no reason for y'all to portray them as this just to get them out the way. Like, I mean, if you really want to show the Foot Clan as badass kids, have them beat up the cops. Exactly. <laughs> have one or two cops really come up against them and lose against these kids, and that'll shut their power just like that. Like, if you want to make a heel turn, beat up a cop and profit. But no, we just make it where they don't fucking care about this group at all. Like, get out of my face. You got, you're saying that there's a group of ninjas. <laughs> there's a group of ninjas out there who were fucking stuff up. Am I supposed to believe that? Yes, motherfucker. Like, I'm literally a reporter. What are we talking about here? exactly God. yeah and and you know i mean april o'neill she's she's been on the trail of that for for a while in this movie i i have a question okay is the foot clan an, an actual like allusion to the hand from marvel comics it could be i don't a know parody of that yes yes the foot clan is a more is a uh, parody of the hand from daredevil because yes. well i guess they were daredevil fans <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Also, um did not think about this when I was 10. There's a lot of things. This is why we do hindsight. Because we see these movies again when I'm an adult and I like them the fuck up. But so when Splinter found the turtles before they stepped into the ooze and they were just walking around in the sewers, Splinter wasn't really Splinter yet. Not really. He, his his intellect was growing as he herded the turtles to his house and they began to move around and get bigger and everything, walking on two feet and talking. He noticed he was getting smarter, too. So prior to that, he was the little kung fu rat that herded four turtles into his little ass. How did they continue to live in the little ass place that he was probably staying in as a rat sized rat into a six foot tall ninja rat? <laughs> don't think exactly. too hard about it <laughs> exactly oh I, man that, that, that's kind of what makes the uh, uh splinter's origin in the uh in the animated series make a little more sense because well, like i said that's literally hamato yoshi just morphed into a a rat a rat yes rat, but you know? yes making him a mutant rat like the mutant turtles kind of also makes sense i mean if he just kind of like evolved into one that's a little bit different than their origin so i mean i kind of see why they would they would change it but at the same time you know it does kind of raise a few questions it does at <laughs> least a few or at least the way they presented it or, or e an even greater que question is how the hell is raf uh, able to go out and see a movie just in a trench coat and a yeah. top and, and, a, and a fedora <laughs> like what the fuck is that <laughs> that's it like, like, is that is that like the same shit that allows uh, Clark Kent to, to just to put on glasses? Just put on glasses, and he's just he's Clark Kent. Take it off, he's Superman. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I, and I, I, I gotta say, I do love that uh, Raph goes and he sees critters. Yeah, he's, and he's just like, where did he come up with this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. 
I mean, for what it's worth, Raphael, Raphael, sorry, um, when he got mad at, at Leonardo uh, when they were arguing about what to do now that Splinter got kidnapped, he did get his ass whooped by the Foot Clan. Oh, he did. Yeah, yeah, he got his ass handed to him actually, like mm-hmm. to, to the point where he was out for multiple days. Mm-hmm. Oh, fucking Como, dude. Ugh. So that makes me feel good that those twelve year olds beat this eighteen year old's ass. Because I tell my <laughs> kids all the time that an army of twelve year olds can whoop anybody's ass absolutely. if they try hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. An, an army of kids, yeah, they they can overwhelm you really quick. So these are questions you have to ask yourself. Exactly how many twelve year olds can I take on? <laughs> well, what's the limit? See, this is like how many licks does it take to get to the tootsie roll center? Of the tootsie pop? <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> and the answer is nine. 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 <laughs> 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 that that tracks. Not about nine of them. <laughs> I can fuck up nine 12 year olds before I get overwhelmed. You smack the first one, the second one you punch in the face, the third one you. Apparently, I, 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 I apologize. I never beat up any 12 year olds. <laughs> um, I just I just want to make sure that it's clear that uh, Trick loved the kids and we do not discuss violence against kids in any way, shape or form in single simulcast LLC. Um, <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, I apologize okay. profusely for saying I beat up nine children. <laughs> and um, if you are listening to this and you are. A woman whose name might be Karen. Uh, I am never giving you my telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for the record, I can at least do about eight or nine. I, I, I could fight eight or nine kids before I get overwhelmed. So that sounds about right. Yeah. No, no. Here at Collateral Cinema, we're fine with saying that. <laughs> <laughs> we are one hundred percent fine with saying that. <laughs> right, Robert. Uh, <laughs> fuck them kids fuck them kids especially especially if they're dressing up as ninjas and going and stealing shit and and, and, and beating up 18 uh, year old turtles so. and burning down apartment complexes like what exactly. <laughs> that, that happens in the middle of this movie that like an a, entire building gets that was burned a home down. that was a home invasion so it, yeah 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 that was yeah. a home invasion because from from what i can tell april kind of owned the whole building that, that was like mm. uh her father's uh like antique shop in yeah, the bottom or the something. The whole building was her house. Yeah. The whole building was pretty mm-hmm. much her, her home. Get old generational wealth. All yeah, exactly. Damn, exactly. God damn it. But yeah, burn they they burn it down. I mean, and, and that that is a really cool fight though. I mean, you know, they're using the antiques to fuck up all the foot soldiers and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is a lot of fun. I mean, I, I think like a lot of the fight choreography in this movie is is just a blast. It really is. And, and once again, it's, it's amazing how these actors were able to do this with all that extra latex and foam on them. Yeah, no kidding. You know, and one of, one of them, incidentally, is Ernie Reyes uh, Jr., who was the, uh, oh, it was Aikido in uh, the uh, second movie. Yeah. Who was a star from fucking Surf Ninjas, let's be honest. And surfing, yeah, exactly, surf ninjas. And also, I remember when he was a kid, he was in a uh, television show that I believe, I don't remember where it, where it aired, but yeah, he was basically an adopted son of a cop, and he uh, used his martial arts to help his uh, adopted dad or whatever. Ba- basically, just, just that, that whole trope of, of a white person adopting a uh, kid of, of color and, uh, you know, just that whole, that whole thing, like with uh, different... What was a different stroke? It wasn't different strokes. It was uh, Gr- Gary Coleman's show. Oh, that's different strokes. Yeah. That's different strokes. Yeah. Okay. Think like two broke dads or something. Two broke dads. <laughs> Stupid. I don't know. But I, I think that uh, yeah, we're getting to uh, the point where we should probably start uh, winding things down and giving our final thoughts and everything. Yeah. So as usual, we'll start with our guest whenever we have a guest host on. Uh, Derek, what are your uh, final thoughts on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? So there's a million ways that this movie could have been better. And yet it was perfect. Um, It was exactly what was needed in that time. Um, And if I had to walk down the list of all of the bullshit that came before it and after it in regards to uh, both video game movies and comic book movies, I would honestly have to put, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Part 1 
number two on my list of best comic book slash superhero movies prior to 1995. Absolutely. Um, right after Batman 89. Um, I think that it did exactly what it needed to do. I wish it had gotten more time. I wish, I wish that at some point they had actually embraced the cartoons because I know that they were striving to embrace the comic book aspect of the show which is why there was no Baxter Stockman. There was no Crane. There was no uh, techno drone. There was no any of that. Um, but I wish they had had that opportunity. Um, and I'm hoping that the movie that's going to come out soon will have that opportunity, but I know that's more of an animated affair. So all bets are off because when it's animated, they can do whatever they want. But mm-hmm. I really, if I were to sit down and watch this movie again, I would still love this movie. Like I would, I would roll my eyes and stuff now, but that's because I watched it when I was fucking 10 and I'm older now. That's just the way that things fucking work out. It's still a classic and it stands the test of time much better than, oh, I don't know off the top of my head, Double Dragon and oh, yeah. Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat Annihilation and really Mortal <laughs> Kombat 1. So... Yeah. I mean, and this came out before all of them. So you have to give it its credit for that. It was a really beautiful combination of arts that led to this being done. And Corey Feldman did a pretty good job. It's <laughs> the final chapter guy. Come final on. Final chapter guy, yeah. It's the final chapter. Tommy Jarvis, bro. Yeah, the Jarvis series. <laughs> all Robert, right. what are your final thoughts yeah, on Robert, TMNT? What are your final thoughts? Um, 1990. I think the original one is the best one and part two secret of the ooze comes second and third one. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not too bad, but all this new stuff with the CGI, Megan Fox shit. I really didn't like that. (laughs) Oh yeah. The Michael Bay shit. Yeah. The Michael Bay shit. I mean, Eh. I remember seeing some of the television series for like Fox when I was a kid too. And they had, they had the TV show, the Adams family too. I remember that. Yeah. So everything's like redone more than once, really. There's always going to be a TV show. There always is. And yeah, yeah, and they're coming out with another movie like this year. Yeah. Actually. Like I think actually this month, I think it is. And that, that actually looks like an interesting movie, I think. Not too bad. I mean, I wish we could go the old school way instead of, a, you know, the CGI shit, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I have a feeling that maybe eventually there's going to be some movies that are still going to keep that going strong. You know, I, it, it would be cool to see uh, somebody take a chance with actual like animatronics again. And just or puppets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just kind of go for that old school aesthetic. You know, I mean, to, to a degree, you can say that that's what Psycho Gorman was a little bit. Yeah, I mean, know, but like keep it animatronic, keep it like CGI, kind of like Chucky still, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, OK, Ash, final thoughts? Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think it's pretty much exactly what I would expect a uh, 1990 film adaptation of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to look like. Uh, I like the whole kind of more dark and gritty atmosphere that comes with it. Uh, And I like how it really kind of brings these uh, characters, you know, to the big screen. And, um, you know, obviously it had big... shoes to fill with that i'm not as familiar you know with like the tmnt lore and 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 the stories and whatnot you know i've seen the cartoon here and there so you know like i'm not i don't really have anything i don't have much to compare it with but so you feel like it does a pretty good job with you know i know the basics obviously but yeah you know like I, i think it does a pretty good job from what i know of the characters um and what i know that you know kind of the the feel of of uh, these stories are and uh i mean i more than that even i'd say it's it's kind of just a blast to watch i mean this is a great movie to uh get high and put on it really is it's a lot of fun to watch even to this day yeah. you know and, and i mean i guess i'll go ahead and give my final thoughts i mean i think that this is the best representation of the teenage mutant ninja turtles by far when it comes to, you know, cinema or even other forms of, uh, of media, you know, uh, I, I do like, uh, how the darkness and grittiness is, uh, there from the comics, but a lot of that can also be explained by the fact that this is actually technically an indie movie, 
by by that. Th- this was at one time the most successful independent movie of, of its of all time. No so kidding. Of, and yeah. yet the budget appears to be worse in the in the two sequels. I don't get that yeah. at all. <laughs> this is New Line Cinema, right? But, yes, which at the time was known for doing art arch house films and and independent cinema. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like Freddy Krueger. So I mean, yeah, this right here, this was kind of a. Uh, a, 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 little, a little bit of a risk for them, you know, mm-hmm. but they were exactly new line was exactly the company to take this uh, movie on and to, to, to make it what it is. And you know, I honestly, I agree with you that this is actually close to Batman 89 as, uh, you know, being just, you know, one of the best uh, superhero comic book movies of its era. It, it yeah. really is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I just love how the, like I said, the animatronics, you know, they have like real emotion to them. Like, like, like that, that, that fire, uh, that campfire scene. I mean, you feel that. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they actually like took this movie and made it like this kind of uh, silly, but kind of gritty, uh, you know, family crime drama with uh, ninjas and turtles that just happen to be in there, you know? And I mean, the, the script still, holds up i mean it, it's still a fun watch this day and you know i love that i have it in my collection i love putting it on every now and again you know c- kind of the same way with like a, you know the first mortal Kombat movie it, it's kind of like that as well to me just just a movie that i can put on at any time and just have fun watching it yeah you know at any given moment so yeah th- this is a movie that does mean a lot to me you know it, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles means a lot to me. And honestly, I can't wait to see uh, what what comes in the future for them. You know, I, I, I am interested in seeing this new movie that's coming out. And like that, that'll be really, really interesting. So but yeah, th- this is like if, if you're into comic book movies, if you're into any type of adaptations of those types of stories, you, you couldn't go and do any worse than this right here. Y'all want any more? Um Trivia? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah Bring uh, it on. Fun fact. <clears throat> yeah. Corey Feldman, who we spoke on in length in this episode, um, said he was offered only $1,500. What? U.S. to do voice work for this film. Fuck that. He accepted oh. because he believed the producers hmm. who told him that this is only a small, low-budget independent film, hoping that it would have moderate success on VHS if they were lucky. <laughs> the movie ended up doing millions of dollars in sales at the box office. Oh, God damn it. Uh, <laughs> she should have taken a percentage. Yeah, I would have been is. like, I want 1500 plus a percentage. Exactly. Oh, man. He did well um, for himself later, so. <laughs> yeah, sure. So. Or earlier. Josh Pies, uh, the guy who played Raphael, suffers from claustrophobia. Oh, uh, man, and he had to be inside that suit the whole time? Yep, Ooh. so every time they finished filming a scene, he would have to take the helmet off extremely quickly. God damn. And they have motors built into the helmets to create facial expressions. Uh, they were packed very tightly into the heads and were very uncomfortable for the performance in the suits. Ooh. Josh also said the noise inside of there was like being in Grand Central Station at rush hour with a tin can over your head. God damn. Yeah. I mean, yeah, with all those uh, little gears and motors running. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah, no mm-hmm. kidding. Ernie Reyes Jr. said the suit because, you know, he uh, took over for Donatello as a stunt person for Donatello. Uh, he said the suit got so hot during filming that he had to drink a gallon of water per day just to stay hydrated. Fuck. God damn. Yeah, that that tracks, man. I mean, it's it's a ginormous suit of latex and rubber and foam. Yeah, I mean, yeah it doesn't come mm-hmm. off in one piece. It's, no, it it's doesn't. It's in sections, I mean, you know? Like, it, I mean, I can't imagine what uh, makeup must have been like you know, day to day making that movie. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Could not have been fun. <sighs> But yeah, yeah, it's good. That's a trivia that's good to know. You know, it's like, I mean, but man, only $1,500 for Corey Feldman. Oh, 1500 on, Man, man yeah. the disrespect. The disrespect of the Feldman. <laughs> Shit, of Tommy Jarvis. Well, all right. Yes, that is our episode on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1990. 
Uh, this is going to be the part where we drop our, all of our plugs and everything. And uh, Derek, if you want to plug your uh, shows again, go ahead. Just tell our listeners where you can find find them. Oh, you can find my podcast where you can find podcasts at. Honestly, like I said, just go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E backslash SSCast and all of my shows pop up. So I have a dramatic serial that I wrote and then edited and did the voice for, and it's really dope, called Sin and Solace. And I did a pop culture show called Single Simulcast that lasts for like almost 400 episodes before I decided to go on hiatus. And then I have a show called The Dream Team that lasts like 200 episodes before I decided to put it on hiatus with me and two other great comedian friends of mine. And then I have a show called Unburdened, which is my mental health show. And I need to get that going again because, you know, why not? Um, but we got to like 30 episodes on that before I moved on. And then I have a show called 20 Minutes where I interview people for 20 minutes on the dot based on something that I'm interested in. Um, and I need to get that going again because I have questions. But basically, like I said, they're all there and they're all really good because I'm amazing. And so you should check it out and be grateful that you get the opportunity to do so, uh, because sooner or later, um, they'll get erased from the Internet. That's just the way the world works. So catch them while you can. Act like I'm a Pokemon. You can also, like I said, R-A-S-H-A-N-I-I. For those of y'all who are high and listening to this and just want to see if it's fact or not, go to Google and type that in and hit enter. The first Five pages or so. It's me, which is a lot of fucking work. I've been doing this since 2009. Wow. Yeah. Wow, man. So oh, man. yeah, respect, man. Shit. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I, I, before SEO. I am the SEO breaker. Like I'm just here, and I'm fun and I'm wonderful. So check me out, and you're welcome. Hell yeah. Fucking a, man. Fucking a. Uh, Ash, what is going on with Collateral Gaming? Well, uh, I just started playing Resident Evil 4 Remake, and it's fucking amazing. I'm having such a fun time with it. So we're definitely going to be doing a game launch review on that. Um, as for our numbered episode this month, of course, we will be continuing the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney trilogy. Uh, Bo will be joining for that. And as we talk about uh, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Justice for All and Trials and Tribulations and I am just as excited as I was for part one uh, as I am for part two and just really in love with this franchise. Man, I got to say, like, uh, playing through this franchise with you has uh, been a lot of fun. Like, I mean, it, it, it's exactly the type of game that's right up my alley, you know? Hell yeah, man. And then uh, coming up in April, uh, we're going to be doing our uh, bad game month. So uh, we're talking about Plumbers Don't Wear Ties and E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Uh, our 420 special will also be coming out next month uh, as we cover not a bad game, a good one, Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Excellent. Awesome. Awesome. And then our uh, season finale, of course, on Tears of the Kingdom, because oof, that is going to be my game of the year. I'm telling you, I already know. Yeah, Legend of Zelda. Hell yeah. <laughs> so check out Collateral Gaming wherever you listen to Collateral Cinema. Uh, and stay tuned for uh, more uh, crossover content between our both podcasts. Definitely. Yeah. And Robert, where can uh, people find you on the social medias? Um, mostly uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You know? Yeah, it's like uh, I think on Twitter you're uh, at Robert Ortegon 3 Yeah, I, b- I barely get on Twitter. So sorry. Yeah, but you do uh, you do post on our uh, shit posting group quite a bit on Facebook, right? Yeah, pretty uh, famous for that. Oh yeah, yeah. We even got the the Robert Ortegon film director Facebook page, so you know. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I help manage. Actually, you made the whole thing. I I just looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. So uh, yeah, and uh, I guess uh, pretty soon here we should be wrapping up production on Texas Sundown. Finally. Yeah, we just need a few more. Uh, scenes really we can just start yeah. wrapping it up and yeah straight to the editing you know I mean I've already done some editing but uh it's not yet done yeah hopefully we can get it done and move on to other things though, right exactly uh, other yeah. things bigger and better things bigger and better things exactly hell yeah bro well all right yeah that is our uh episode on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Ninja Turtles. You can find uh, Collateral Cinema wherever you get your podcasts. 
Uh, also, check us out on Patreon as uh, we do have $1 and $5 tiers. And uh, pay any amount of money, you get access to exclusive full-length movie commentaries. Exactly. Uh, the latest one we did was Bloodsport, I believe. And, and stick around because we are going to be doing the Morbius. We're getting more. We are again. getting more again. That Morbius. should be the next film commentary. Morbius yeah, I'm, I'm excited because uh, we uh, we introduced uh, that movie to Robert. Finally, Robert <laughs> finally got morbed, and I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be an epic commentary. Hell yeah! That is going to be so epic. Well, all right. I guess uh, we can go ahead and end it there. Uh, with all that said, I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Robert Ortegon. I'm Ashley Chancellor. And I'm Derek DeGrant. And this was Collateral Cinema with Hindsight Movie Reviews and all the other shows that Derek works on. <laughs> See you later, everybody. Peace. Bye. you're letting yourself in for. A turtle's gotta do what a turtle's gotta do. Please, Michelangelo, don't go for pizza. Turtle. Collateral Cinema is a Collateral Media Podcast. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.